Everybody here this morning, we're going to pick up where we left off a couple of weeks ago on the, on the uh, Passover. Uh, let's, uh, let's pray. We need the wisdom of God. We need, his, we need the illumination of the Holy Spirit. We need the author of the book to open it up to us. Father, I pray that you say if we lack wisdom, let us ask of God. Father, I'm praying for wisdom. And then, Lord, I'm asking for the gift of teaching. And I pray for my brothers and sisters that you give them hearts that are receptive to receive the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, if you've got to the book of Exodus, chapter number 12, and verse number 13. Exodus, chapter number 12. Verse number 13. The book is so named because it... Uh, Starts out with Israel in uh, Egyptian bondage, and uh, they are delivered from that bondage. They exit uh, Egypt. The Bible said, The blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Notice the wording is very clear. I will pass over you. Yeah. Yeah. And so we, the, the Lord God institutes the Passover, which is the, the greatest of all the feast days of Israel. It's also the first. It's the beginning of months with them. It's the start of their calendar. It reminds them that everything else that follows during the year, all of the other feast days would have no meaning whatsoever had it not been for the fact that they are now redeemed. They've been made free. They've been set free from bondage. And you don't start at the rear and work up. You start at the front and go from the rest uh, out to the rest of it. And that's exactly what happens here. If there was no Passover, there'd be no Feast of Unleavened Bread. There'd be no Feast of Pentecost. There'd be no Feast of Tabernacles. There'd be no Yom Kippur. There'd be none of that if it wasn't for the Passover. So the Passover in Hebrew is the Pascha. The Pascha. And uh, that's where you get the uh, Passover lamb. And the, the apostle or John the Baptist, when he saw the Lord Jesus, says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's a direct reference to the Passover lamb here in, uh, Hebrew, or in Exodus chapter number 12. I want you to look at some of the elements of it, though. In the book of Matthew, chapter 26, and verse 28, Matthew 26 and verse 28, the Lord Jesus Christ chose the season of the Passover to be the time of, the, uh, of His sacrifice. He, he could have chosen tabernacles, he could have chosen Pentecost or any of the rest of it, but no, no, it would not work. He chose the Passover. And it is the season of the Passover where the Lord institutes what's called the Lord's Supper. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28, the scripture says he took the blood and took the cup rather and said, verse 28, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, it's a, it's a strange thing. I mean, just think about it. I know it's common to you. You've heard it so many times before. But when he takes the cup and says, this is my blood, obviously the blood was still in his body, coursing through his veins and his arteries. But when he lifted that cup up and said, now this is the blood, my blood of the New Testament, he was making a statement that reached far beyond uh, what could be apparent physically. He's speaking in a different level now. He's introducing something here that you've got to, uh, you've got to look at in the sense that he's saying it. Uh, but I want you to notice in this part, first of all, before we move to, to something else about this, notice what it says here. It said, this is the blood, my blood. This is my blood, yeah. not the blood. My blood. <laughs> this is my blood of the New Testament, yeah. which is shed for many for the remission of sins. All right, the word testament here is the Greek word diatheke. Now, I make a big deal about this because it is a big deal. The new Bibles, 
probably, uh, I don't know if all of them, but most of them translate the word diatheke here as the new covenant. And if you have a reference in the side column reference, or you have an NIV or any of the new Bibles, you'll find that he, uh, that this is translated, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. All right. Now, is the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross the ratification of the new covenant? Yes, it is. There is no argument whatsoever in that. But they change the translation from the King, the King James Bible translated diatheke, testament. They translate diatheke, covenant. Is it wrong to translate diatheke, covenant? No, not at all, because the word can be translated either way. It can be translated covenant, but it can be translated testament. But they get into trouble. <clears throat> the King James translators are amillennial baby sprinklers. What does that mean? Amillennial means that they don't believe in the millennium. They are essentially believe in the doctrine of replacement theology that the church replaces Israel. They believe that. Therefore, uh, Israel is finished, done for. The wrath of God has come upon them to the uttermost. And they're wiped from the face of the earth, have no more distinction, no more, uh, no more racial identity and what have you. That's gone. All right? As far as, as far as God's concerned, doesn't exist. Now, that's what an amillennialist believes. No millennium. Baby sprinkling means that the baptism is part of salvation. This is why they baptize babies. They sprinkle them. It is called a sacrament where grace is ministered. The baby is saved, becomes a Christian. I think, I don't know when it is, eight days after the birth or whenever it is, it makes no difference, but they're sprinkled. It's called Christian baptism. Now, you might have been baptized as a baby. You might have been sprinkled as a baby. What does that do to me, preacher? It does nothing. It does nothing. It may be a, may be a pretty ceremony and all that, but it does nothing. This is why Baptists have been persecuted for centuries because we believe in what's called believer's baptism. Yeah. Believer's baptism is subsequent to salvation. And, uh, but here's the point. Why would amillennial baby sprinklers translate diatheke as testament and not as covenant? Now, you see, you'll have to go home and think on that this afternoon uh, because there's a reason they did that because they could just as easily have translated it covenant like the NIV translators and like the people today who, I marvel at how people just so flippantly say, this is a mistranslation and blah, blah, and on they go. I marvel at that because there's a lot of arrogance involved in it, folks. It's the flesh getting involved. It's pride. Fifty of the greatest scholars alive in 1611 translated this Bible you've got in your hand. I'm talking about scholars. I'm not talking about somebody that's had a year to a Greek or had a word study in a Bible college somewhere. I'm talking about men who gather together at a group here, a group here, a group here, a group here, a group here. They translated, compared their notes, and then gave you what you have here as the, author as the authorized version of 1611. It has had some revisions in spelling and so forth. Yes, it has. But the truth of the matter is, what you have in your hands here is the Word of God. It either is or it isn't. If you don't believe it's the Word of God, then, you know, you get into the situation where you, in, you are in the relativism which dominates thinking today, and this is what people want. This recently, they've come out with a Sodomite Bible. They've come out with all kinds of Bibles. They're going to continue to proliferate. There's no end to it. Once Pandora's box is open, there's no stopping it. And uh, so all kinds of Bibles are going to be produced into the future. If the Lord doesn't come back soon, you can go find anything you want to to support however you want to live. The precedent is set in 1889 when they came out with a revised version of 1889. Well, now, I don't want to get too much into all this stuff, but I want to try to make a point with you th this morning. The Bible here in your Bible, King James Bible, says Testament. I want you to go over here to the book of Hebrews with me now, chapter number 9 and verse number 16. Hebrews 9, 16. All right, now watch carefully. 
Same word, diatheke, Hebrews 9, 16. For where a covenant is, there must also of necessity be the death of the covenanter. All right, now let's just say it is translated like that. Is that correct? Let's say the translation, let's say I translate diatheke as covenant, but the statement doesn't bear it out. You don't have to be dead to have a covenant between two people. You see, God made a covenant with Abraham when he was asleep. <laughs> he was in a trance. You see, all right. So what happens to the new Bibles? Get you an NIV. Lo and behold, they translate the word diatheke as testament. They translate it as testament. Now you're going to have to think, why are they translating it testament and not covenant here? Well, the answer on the surface of it is very simple. The surface answer is this. It won't fit. <laughs> it won't fit. They're forced to translate diatheke as testament because it's obvious that there's no way that you can make, you can say it's a covenant because there's nowhere in the Bible that ever bears out that one has to die in order for the covenant to, to come into force. You see what I mean? But what it says plainly in Hebrews 9 is, one must die in order for the testament to come into force. All right? Must die. Okay. And so when the Lord Jesus instituted the new covenant, all of this happened before he died on the cross. And so in my mind, the King James translator says, well, he's not dead yet. Let's call it a testament because he's going to ratify it at the cross. For his death on the cross makes it a testament. Right? Yeah. Now the new covenant. Think about it a moment. Look at Hebrews chapter number 8. Hebrews 8. Verse number 8. Verse 7. For the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new, what? With who? Now, has he made that yet? This is where you get into, this is where you have to understand, you have to open the Bible up. Has he made a new covenant with the house of Israel? No, he hadn't unless you replace Israel with the church. See what you get into? What you have to do, if you take Israel out and say the church replaces Israel, everywhere it mentions Israel, henceforth in the New Testament, it has to be the church for your theology to work. But here plainly it says a new covenant he's going to make. Did he say covenants or covenant? Only one covenant. One covenant. All right. The testament is a aspect of of the covenant that is applied in this present age to born again believers that was ratified, in other words, came into power, came into being at the death of the testator. But the covenant itself, the new covenant, was not exhausted because it reached much further into the future and applies to a people who have rejected the New Testament. Now, let me say it another way. Whether these King James translators even understood what they're going, what's going on here or not, he made a, they make a clear distinction between believers who are, made, who, are, who are the New Testament body of Christ who have been born again under the New Testament and those believers in the future who will be, become part of the New Covenant. There is a distinction made between the two and it's hard to confuse them. Everywhere in the New Testament that I read the word, when I say New Testament, that's in the general sense, refer to the 27 books. Because you can see how words can be used differently too. That's a, a point to make right there. See, Everywhere in the New Testament that I read about the New Covenant, I notice how that the covenant is something that God promised to Israel. And the Testament was something that right was, 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 was a, I don't know, how do you say it, came off of that new, test, uh, of new Covenant and clearly makes a distinction between two groups. We enjoy the benefit of the New Covenant, but we're brought into the benefit of the New Covenant by virtue of the New Testament. That's how.
And here again, I, I just marvel at the fact that amillennial baby sprinklers who believe that God was finished once and for all with the Jew, done with them, translated it like that. And the people come back today and they give you the NIV and the rest of these Bibles and they put it covenant over there in Hebrews, uh, rather in Matthew. If you don't make a distinction between the two, it would be easy for somebody to come along and say, well, now, wait a minute, if this is the new covenant of his blood, what's the new covenant he's talking about in Hebrews chapter number 8? Is that a different covenant? He said, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. No, it's not a different covenant. There's only one. But the New Testament, the New Testament is that will that God wills to you. That's what it means. A will and testament. He willed to you at his death that you would be the body of Christ and inherit all that he inherits because he as the, how do you say it? You remember last time, the last time I got up here and spoke to you? I told you how that the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, I told you how that you have been adopted. You remember that? I, I told you how that the adoption and the new birth are, t one has to do with the essence, how you're changed, that's the new birth, but the adoption has to do with a legal declaration. And the only way you'd know you were adopted if somebody told you. And so the Bible tells you you've been adopted, all right? It is because of the adoption that you become an heir. You inherit through the adoption. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ has, through his resurrection, as the, as the last Adam, has inherited all things. He is an heir, and we are joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now think about it for a minute. Is he not the Lord of glory? When he came from above, did he not own everything? But it's by, that, by the fact that he's incarnate, the God-man, resurrected from the dead, that he now inherits through that identity that he has now, all these things, and we inherit them through him. Yeah. So there is in the Bible, you might want to call it a little bit, a bit, a little bit of a nuance, a little bit of a, uh, uh, you have to kind of stand back and look at it and think on it. But there's a definitely a clear distinction drawn between the body of Christ and the Israel and between the born-again believer and those who will yet in enjoy the benefits of the new covenant. And that day will come. Now, I want you to go to John chapter number 6 and verse number 53. John 6, 53. Verily I say to thee, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Now, the Passover, remember? What he did, he took the cup and said, this is the New Testament of my blood. All right. Did he literally change that cup into his blood? That's what the Catholic teaches. He teaches that the, that the very presence of God, the presence of Christ, is in what's called the Eucharist. The Eucharist, let me say this right now, from what I've learned by personal study, the Eucharist is the basis for everything that has to do with the Roman Catholic Mass, the institution of the priesthood, the Catholic priesthood, and their relationship with God. It's all bound up and defined and identified in the Eucharist. The word Eucharist means, the Greek word Eucharisto means I give thanks. It's a giving of thanks, but it's far more than that to the Catholic. It's also a sacrifice. Have you ever heard a reference to the sacrifice of the mass? You ever heard it called that? Few have. Most of you haven't. Well, that's what it's called. It's called the sacrifice of the mass. So what are they sacrificing? Uh, I probably stick my nose in places I shouldn't be sticking it. <laughs> but that's just my nature. And I have watched a number of times on EWTN. How many know what network I'm talking about? the Eternal Word Television Network. I have watched a number of times. They have a section in there where they're singing 
and they have, they have the crucifix, and they're singing, I offer to thee the body and blood of Christ. And they're singing to God the Father. And in that song, they are offering up the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. And the first time I ever heard that, it sounded strange to me. I thought, why should they be giving to God the Father the body and blood of Christ when he gave to us? Why is it necessary for us to give to him? You see, why is that? Think about that. You'll never, you'll, never, you'll never get anywhere to learn anything until you begin to think on it in your mind and begin to, and begin to you, can t you can take a monkey and teach them how to, you know, monkey see, monkey do. You can, you can, you can, uh, you can take anybody and, and give them rote memorization and they can memorize something and quote it back to you and not have a clue what they're talking about. It, that's not what we're after in here. What we're after in here, I want to make you think why you are what you are and why you reject certain things and accept certain things. Why don't you go to the Mass? If it's necessary for you to take the body and blood of Christ physically, which of course has a spiritual meaning, offered up by their priest, and if you don't, you have no part in Christ, why don't you do that? Well, I've never done it that way. I'm just a Baptist. That's the way I've been raised. That won't work. That's a sorry answer. That's about as sorry as it can be. That won't help anybody. You know, that's not the way we do it. That doesn't mean a thing. That's not our tradition. I don't care anything about my, somebody's tradition. That's what Al Gore said, your faith tradition. That's a meaningless term. <laughs> yes, sir. I know you did. You, you were raised as a Catholic. You've been to Mass many times, haven't you? Yes, sir. No, that, that's, we're headed to that. That's exactly right. But that's your observation's right. Yeah, the host. It, it, yeah, right. 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 Now, can somebody take the Mass and, and still be saved? Let me tell you what saves a person. Accepting or rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it saves and that's what condemns. Yes, sir. What he introduced to you is Mariology. There's four basic foundational principles to Mariology. Now, these are important. These are the four basic things about Mariology. Number one, Immaculate Conception. She was born without original sin. Okay? Number two, Mother of God. God Almighty was born of the Virgin Mary. Okay? Number three, Perpetual Virginity. She never had any other children except the one that was, she was impregnated by the power of the Holy Spirit. And number four, the assumption of Mary. Mary was carried into heaven. Uh, just like the, the, the Muslims teach that Muhammad ascended to heaven on a white horse on top of that rock over there at Moriah. Uh, all of this, of course, is a play on what happens in Acts chapter 1. When they beheld him, he was carried up from them. All right. So that's the four basic fundamental things. In some places you'll find Mary on the cross instead of Christ. She's called the co-redemptrix. She's a co-redeemer. They say they don't worship her, but they give her the title of the Queen of Heaven. And I have listened to EWTN time and time again. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. They put her as an intercessor between them and God. 
She takes an exalted position that is not human. She's not fully God, but she's certainly between you and God. And they've lifted her up to a position like that. Now that's, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, uh, there's not one word in Scripture about it. But the fathers that I'm going to quote to you in just a moment, the church fathers, had a lot to say about the Eucharist. And they also build the dogma of Mariology, which, of course, if you are a Protestant and, uh, or if you're a Bible believer, what have you, you will call it Mariolatry. But the doctrines of the Catholic Church did not happen overnight. They grew over a period of hundreds and hundreds and sometimes thousands of years. It didn't happen overnight. It developed over a long period of time and is still developing. And uh, to this very day, the early church fathers fit into three categories. The apostolic church fathers. These are the ones who touched the, the ap apostles. They lived with them. Like, uh, for example, Ignatius and like uh, Polycarp and uh, men like that. They lived in the first century. These are apostolic church fathers. Then there are the anti-Nicene church fathers. They're the ones who lived up before the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. Then there are the post-Nicene church fathers, the ones who lived after Nicaea, 325 A.D. Why Nicaea? Nicaea was called by Constantine the Great. And the reason he called the council, and this is the, I think it's the second. I know it's not the first. The first council is in Acts 15. But I think it's the second council ever called, and he called it together to try to have some peace among warring parties over doctrine. And so they hammered out what you're supposed to believe as a Christian, and they produced what's called the Nicene Creed as a product of that. And they addressed heresy and so forth and so on, church polity in some cases. But Constantine was the emperor of the Roman Empire who had converted to Christianity. And I say all of this, you know, God knows if he did or not. I pray he did. But uh, converted to Christianity. And he held this council. And the purpose of this council was to get straightened up what Christians were supposed to believe. Up until 325 A.D., there was a lot of controversy about one, what one would believe. One of the biggest sources of controversy came from North Africa. It came from... Uh, the area of Philo of Alexandria, who was a Neoplatonist Jew. It came from where we have what's called the Gnostic Gospels. Plenty of that stuff around today. Elaine Pagels has written a book on it. I guess she got a PhD from it. I don't know. But the Gnostic Gospels, all this stuff. All this was floating around the first couple of centuries after Christ. But during this period of time, the Orthodox Church Fathers... When I say Orthodox, I'm talking about the men that the Catholic Church quotes as authority. The Orthodox Church Fathers began to lay the groundwork for the Roman Catholic Mass. For example, Ignatius was martyred at, at, the, at the hands of lions. He died a martyr's death. As noble as a man could, with as much courage as a man possibly could have. But listen to what he said about what we're talking about. Saint, they called him Saint Ignatius of Antioch, 110 A.D. Quote, I have no taste for corruptible food, nor for the pleasures of this life. I desire the bread of God, which is the flesh of Jesus Christ, who was of the seed of David, and for drink I, drink his, I desire his blood, which is love incorruptible. Take care. Another quotation. Then, to use one Eucharist so that whatever you do, you do according to God. For there is one flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ and one cup in the union of his blood, one altar, that's the altar of the mass, and there is one bishop with the presbytery, refer to the bishop of Rome. This is a letter to the Philadelphians. And uh, Ignatius goes on to say, they, in parenthesis the Gnostics, abstain from the Eucharist and from prayer because they do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ, flesh which suffered for our sins and which the Father in His goodness 
raised up again. This is a letter to the Smyrnians. This is what Ignatius said, who died a martyr's death about the Eucharist. In plainer words, he laid the groundwork that the Eucharist, which obviously is taking place long after the death, resurrection, death, burial, resurrection of Christ, the ascension of Christ, the right hand of the Father, no flesh of his is left on this earth. So how in the world is Ignatius going to take his flesh and take his blood? But he says, I must take his flesh, I must take his blood. So how's that done? It's done by a spiritual transformation, transubstantiation. The sacrifice of the Mass is the, lit, is, the, is the literal body and blood of Christ offered in an unbloody manner because there is no physical blood presence and there is no physical body present, but it, is, it has been transformed into that. Why is that so? Why do they do that? Why is, why is it so necessary to have transubstantiation? Somebody tell me, why, why would you have to have it? Because you don't have the physical body. You don't have the physical blood, yet if you have to take the physical body and you have to take the physical blood, you say, well, I don't know if you have to take the physical body and blood. Well, look at John 6.53. This is where they get that from, John 6.53. Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, drink his blood, you have no part in me. But he goes on further in that same chapter, John chapter number 6, and tells them the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, the Bible says that he gave them drink, and he gave them drink from a rock. And he said that that rock which followed them was Christ. All right? Do you think that that rock was the physical Christ? Of course not. But it was a spiritual representation of Christ. Because he, what they were receiving was water from the rock, which nourished their physical bodies but had a far greater meaning than simply water that would fit that would nourish your physical body because he says i if any man thirst let him come unto me and drink see referring to the fact that the water i give you to the woman of samaria at the well will be in you a well of water springing up into everlasting life this he spake concerning the spirit that we should receive the holy spirit you see how these things work so what they've done is to take this and to make an offering and a sacrifice of it. Why did they do that? They give a sacrifice and an offering because of what Ignatius and others, I won't take a lot of time to read all that. It takes a whole lot of time. There's a bunch of church fathers here. Martin Luther made this statement about them, and uh, he, uh, he made a lot of statements. As a matter of fact, you ought to read his commentary on Galatians. It's good. Martin Luther. How many know who Martin Luther is? Martin Luther. He was, uh, he was one who was in jeopardy of his life, and he was a reformer, and he was a former Roman Catholic, uh, 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 what do they call him, uh, uh, monk. He was a monk, and he got saved, and he realized salvation was by grace. But here's what he said, he, and he's the one who nailed the 95 Thesis on the door at Wittenberg when Johann Tetzel was out selling indulgences and all that so that they could raise a lot of money and build. He said this, he said, he said, the church fathers ought to be called the church babies. <laughs> That's what Martin Luther said. He wasn't given to mincing words. So why did he say that? He said that because every time he tried to convince one of his former colleagues from Scripture, he was taken to a church father and tradition as the authority. That's what happened to him, see? That's why he got so angry with them. All right? Now, why? I want you to look at a couple of passages with me. I want you to look over here to uh, uh, John chapter number 20, verse number 23. John 20, verse 23. And Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. John 20, 23. This is the uh, post-resurrection appearance of the Lord. He officially uh, endues them with the, with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He anoints them personally with the Holy Spirit. 
Acts 2, Acts chapter number 2 is the official coming of the Holy Spirit to create the body of Christ, baptize them into Christ. But here this hand-picked few are being anointed personally. And verse 23 said, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. Whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. I'm going to tell you right now, this is one of the most difficult passages in all the Bible. Don't ever let anybody skim through this and fly over it and give you some first grade meaning to it like, they have, like they've got it all figured out. What he said to these men is powerful. If you retain their sins, they're retained. If you remit them, they're remitted. Now go to Matthew chapter number 16, verse 19. You want to know where they build a priesthood on? Matthew chapter number 16, verse 19. He said to Peter, he said, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. There's a lot of different interpretations of this. Most common interpretation is that Peter was used of the Lord, moving into the book of Acts, as the one who initially opened the door to the Gentiles. He really did. He opened the door to the Gentiles before the apostle Paul, who was called the apostle to the Gentiles. It was Peter that was sent to the house of Cornelius, a Gentile. And when Peter was sent to the house of Cornelius, a Gentile, and then in the first council, Acts chapter number 15, it was Peter that stood up and said, hold on boys, talking to these Judaizers who were trying to drag them all back under circumcision, keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. It was Peter that stood up and said, wait a minute, <laughs> and recounted to them what had happened to him that day when he went into the house of Cornelius. And uh, God showed Peter that he had also granted to the Gentiles repentance. And so Peter's opening another door. He's turning another key, which is uh, opening the way to the kingdom of heaven. Notice it's the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of God. But in any event, it, uh, that's one interpretation, and that's the one that I, that I hold to the closest of any of the rest of them. The other interpretation is that, as the Catholics see it, is that Peter has been given the key and you'll see that key everywhere in the Roman Catholic Church. It's the key of St. Peter in a cathedral. What is a cathedral? A cathedral is a building that has a cathedra. A cathedra is a Latin for a chair. It's where he speaks forth from the chair and he speaks ex cathedra. He speaks with absolute divine authority. Therefore he opens, no man shuts. He shuts, no man opens. It is the authority of the Pope. And so therefore, their interpretation is that Peter being the first Pope, that this was handed by apostolic succession to them, and that they are the source of the truth, and that they can shut, no man opens, open, no man shuts, and the source of the truth comes through the Roman Catholic Church. That's their interpretation of it. I don't hold to that. I don't hold to that. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Uh... But what happened in the first century is that a priesthood was developed out of a number of reasons. I've given you a couple of them already. One of the reasons for the priesthood is so that they could offer up the sacrifices, the mass, the sacrifice of the mass. The other purpose of the priesthood is so that a hierarchy could be developed that would be in control of the dissemination of the truth, the power over people. The power of giving forth, as they call it, the truth. The, teach, the priest in the Old Testament was responsible to teach the truth. That was one of his jobs. That was one of his duties. It included more than just sacrifice. He had to teach. And when the priest in the Old Testament got so bad off that they were falling over the tables, puking because they were drunk and wallowing in their own vomit. And you'll find that in the Old Testament. You'll find that God raised up prophets. The prophet came from obscurity, oblivion, came from nowhere, just like Elijah, the Tishbite, from nowhere. All of a sudden, he comes from nowhere and he says, thus saith the Lord, your priesthood has failed, your sacrifice has failed, your teaching has failed, and God has reverted to his prophet. And so God separates the powers in the Old Testament and shows you how he does it. And, and that's, anybody that's got any sense will agree with that. A separation of powers is a check on power and authority.
When you have a judicial branch, an executive branch, and a legislative, legislative branch, you've got a check of balances, checks and balances. If you get a dictator in the office on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, you get a dictator in there, at least you've got a Congress and you've got a Supreme Court that can balance out the power. You see what I mean? The founding fathers of this country took the biblical position because God separated the powers and gave them, and gave them. You say, well, the king was almighty. Not when Nathan stood before him. You didn't see David lift a finger to Nathan. You know why? Yes, Samuel, because, Nathan, because David knew that Nathan came from the same place that Samuel came from. <laughs> yeah, he did. You don't mess with God's prophet. Saul, the first king of Israel, was so demented, so, so crazed in his hatred for David that he went to Nob. When he got to Nob, he took the priest of the Lord, the priest, and had them put to death. The priest at Nob. One of the most heinous things that he, he committed while he was an insane madman demon-possessed. He had the priest put to death. And so what have you got? You've got a separation of powers. Because what happened? Samuel stood before Saul and said, God has ripped the kingdom from you and given it to another. He's taken it from you. Samuel said, I anointed you from the power of God and God's taken away from you what you got. And did it happen like the prophet said? Of course it did. In the Old Testament, they knew that if he was a real prophet of God, what he said happened. And if it didn't happen, he wasn't a true prophet. Separation of powers. And so it is today. And uh, as long as this country will ever survive, it will survive only because that it has a separation of powers, of checks and balances. And that checks and balances is so absolutely necessary. And there's another balance involved in this checks and balances that they all want to forget about. You have the judicial, you have the, you have the legislative, and you have the executive branch. You've also got God Almighty. He raises up kingdoms and puts them down. He put Nebuchadnezzar on his, on his knees, crawling around like a dog, eating grass for seven years. The Bible said his fingernails grew out and curled and long. His hair grew long. He looked like a, he looked like a lion yeah. out there in the woods. Here was the great king of Babylon, the head of gold, <laughs> the beginning of the Gentile kingdoms in 606 B.C. The, the supreme, he was the greatest of all Gentile kingdoms because he was gold. They all degenerate from him. And yet, with him, God said, I'll take you and show the rest of the world who God Almighty is. And he put him out in the field. Don't ever forget, folks, that he's Almighty God. Don't ever forget. If he wants to, he can take from the face of this earth anybody at any time. And he doesn't have to answer to anyone. Amen. That's a little preaching in here with the teaching. Glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> you done run out of time. <laughs> It's hard for a preacher to teach sometimes, and uh, vice versa, but that's all right. We'll get back into it next week and show, show, show you the, uh, the continue the development and then the transmission of it and where it's brought us today. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you'd use what we've said this morning for the glory of God. In thy holy name I pray. Bless your holy, righteous name. In thy name, amen.